the black Maniche shoe in the size 10. You speak Prada? This week on At the Movies, Isla Fisher stars in Confessions of a Shopaholic. You ready for this? They'll get to you. If they can't get to you, they'll get to your family. Clive Owen and Naomi Watts try to take down the world's most powerful bank in the international. Is that your bedroom in the back? I can see you from my apartment. Gwyneth Paltrow and Joaquin Phoenix in what may be his last... Plus, Jason is back in a remake of the original Friday the 13th. You know that thing when you see someone cute and he smiles and your heart kind of goes like warm butter sliding down hot toast? Well, that's what it's like when I see a store. Declined. Can you try again? Really declined. Isla Fisher goes on a spending spree in the big screen adaptation of the popular books. I'm Ben Lyons from E! Entertainment. And I'm Ben Mankiewicz from Turner Classic Movies. Our first movie, Confessions of a Shopaholic, tells the story of Rebecca Bloomwood, played by Isla Fisher. She's an aspiring journalist, but like Woodward and Bernstein, she knows you can't win a Pulitzer unless you're wearing Jimmy Choo shoes and carrying a Marc Jacobs handbag. Dress, Zach Posen. Belt, Todd Oldham Vintage. Bag, Gucci! And worth every penny. Rebecca is deep in debt, unable to stop spending, hiding from a debt collector when she stumbles into a job writing an advice column for a financial magazine. Uh-oh, I smell trouble and forced irony. I wanted a thousand words on APRs from an angle. Is that not an angle? Not unless you call head-on an angle. No, I don't. Try it again. Remind me why I hired you. Okay. Rebecca? <gasps> did you just type good angles on APRs into Google? Rebecca's reluctance to tell her editor, the handsome principal Hugh Dancy, that she's deep in debt is emblematic of the film's many problems. Every conflict feels totally artificial. One simple conversation could have avoided every contrivance. Just tell your boss you're in debt and therefore understand the problems of the average consumer. The movie totally abandons any sense of reality and plausibility. It seemed like a long, bad Three's Company episode. Just tell Mr. Furley you're not gay and get it over with and skip Confessions of a Shopaholic. You know, I think Isla Fisher does have a nice comedic timing to her. I like yeah. some of her previous work. I also like her doing serious things in a movie like The Lookout. Here she is giving it everything she's got, and it's just not enough. You know, this is the film there where the clothes are the focus, and yeah. I don't really know much about women's fashion, but no? I know, I, I, are you surprised there, yeah. Mac, really? But you know what, though? I know these clothes were kind of the leftovers from Sex and the City. Patricia <laughs> Fields, kind of the, the same costume designer, did both, and here they are Devil with Wars Prada Devil also. Wears Prada. And I can tell that those films have some really top quality clothes in those movies but here it's just like she looks crazy like she doesn't even look like a fashionista she looks out of her mind like she just picked up whatever was on the floor and left over from Carrie Bradshaw's closet and there like you said there's so many moments where if she simply just explained herself there's one scene where she's a, oh, at a party where she's not supposed to be there and she ends up the waitress and just, she say hey say, I'm not the I'm waitress a guest. I'm a guest at the party exactly little things like that start to add up after a while very frustrating I, I agree with you and I like Isla Fisher and John Goodman and Joe Cusack and Leslie Bibb and Kristen Scott Thomas, it doesn't work and there's some real hypocrisy in it that bothered me too. This is a movie that's warning us against the dangers of being slaves to labels while at the same time celebrating those same designer brands. I don't mind a little hypocrisy, but I think this is this was artless hypocrisy. Make no surprise here, I'm gonna have to say skip confessions of a shopaholic. Next up, another romantic comedy. This time it's the big screen star-studded spin-off of the best-selling self-help book. He's just not that into you. Justin Long and Kevin Connolly play roommates, know, trying to stay afloat in the troubled waters of dating in your 20s. Connolly gets set up with an overeager Jennifer Goodwin, but still longs for Scarlett Johansson. All right, now see if you can keep up. Johansson is sleeping with Bradley Cooper, who's cheating on Jennifer Connolly, whose best friend is Jennifer Aniston, who's at a crossroads in her seven-year relationship with Ben Affleck. So you don't, so you think it's great that they're getting married, but you don't ever feel like we're going against nature or something by not getting married? No. Going against nature is like the cat who suckled that monkey. Add Drew Barrymore to the mix who runs a newspaper where Kevin Connolly takes out ads for his real estate business and it all comes full circle. At times the movie does feel modern and relevant to the text messaging cyber dating world in which we live. I can't text. You know, I'm not charming via text. Well, maybe you should just stop texting. But it's not just texting, it's email, it's voicemail, 
It's snail mail. That's regular mail. Whatever, none of it's working. Ultimately, however, the movie gets smothered by one romantic comedy cliche after another. It resorts back to what I consistently dislike about movies of this genre. Everything ties together so conveniently at the end that it loses believability and focus. If you like silly escapism, then I guess this is the movie for you. But for any real insight on relationships or good quality romantic comedy, turn elsewhere. You can skip it. Well, I agree that if you want sort of advice on relationships, you probably need to do something better than go see a movie. But nonetheless, I, I generally disagree with you. I really like this movie. My expectations were low after seeing the, tr seeing the trailer because it seemed like we were headed for another cliche-driven romantic comedy. But this movie is much more serious than that. It is a much more highbrow even than that. I thought that uh, there was a level of sophistication in the relationships that I certainly did not expect. I don't think everything ties together at the end. Some characters are left dangling. We, we, obviously, we know that they go on the with their lives. Who don't don't uh, end up with somebody. I'm not going to give it away, but it just kind of comes together too conveniently at the end. And for two thirds of this film, I was kind of into it. I thought it was a modern love story about people finding each other. And more so than Shopaholic or any of these other romantic comedies, the guys in this movie are not just accessories to the women and one dimensional characters. No, not at to all. To the film's credit, they are fully developed characters. However, I felt that they kind of compromised most of their ideals that they stood for in the end just to help everything wrap up nicely. I don't together. think so. I really, I loved the ending. I loved that stuff was left dangling. And I want to, just to, because people criticize her, I think, far too often. There's a moment in the movie when Jennifer Aniston learns that Ben Affleck isn't going to marry her. Uh, and she, uh, she delivers a very nice scene there. And I think it's a reminder that we saw from The Good Girl and Derailed and Friends with Money. Give her good material and Jennifer Aniston can really deliver a performance. You're right. She's fine in this and she's often and unfairly criticized. Coming up next, Clive Owen and Naomi Watts uncover a worldwide conspiracy in the international. And later, could this really be Joaquin Phoenix's last movie? We'll review Two Lovers. Hi. Hi. What do they know about you that I don't? I know that there has to be a way to bring down this bank. You would have to go outside the system of justice. Because everyone is involved. Everyone. After the likes of Paul Blart, Bride Wars, and My Bloody Valentine 3D, I've been craving a movie made for grown-ups. Well, it's arrived with The International, a sleek conspiracy thriller from German director Tom Tickver, starring Clive Owen as an Interpol agent and Naomi Watts as a Manhattan DA investigating money laundering and arms dealing by a shady international bank that seems to employ as many hitmen as it does tellers. Two years ago, we began receiving intelligence regarding the International Bank of Business and Credit. Anyone that's ever been in a position to move against this bank has either ended up dead or disappeared. You are accusing the world's largest bank of conspiracy and murder. But there is no evidence. Tickfer, who directed the fast-paced and inventive Run Lola Run back in 98, gets you invested in the international right away with an intriguing murder and an unexpected car accident. It then moves on to set up an elaborate conspiracy, but one I think holds up to scrutiny. But despite the intricacies of international finance, this is definitely an action film. An elaborate and really well shot gunfight at New York's Guggenheim Museum is really one of the best I've seen in some time. Clive Owen is strong as always, Naomi Watts too. The International felt like a film directed by the late Sidney Pollack in his prime. I say see it. Ben, you mentioned at the top of your review some of the stinkers that have come out in recent weeks, and I too was in the mood for a smart, intelligent, yeah. adult movie, and this is that at times. But I learned some things in this movie. Apparently, bullets don't hit people. And you mentioned that Guggenheim Museum. Are the walls made a fortress there? I mean, this is a movie that has to be real in order to be good. And that's what I love about the Jason Bourne series and the Bourne Identity movie. You really kind of lose yourself in the characters and the international locations, and it feels real. After a 10-minute gunfight, he just walks out into Central Park, bloodied, and no one stops him. Well, He, he was walks into a police station after being detained and walks out the front door and gets in a car, and he it's had totally assist, fine. He had significant assistance from real professionals, both times and I think eight to ten people died in that Guggenheim gunfight a lot of people died but our lead who we're supposed to believe is in peril obviously really isn't I really didn't have any problem with any of that I thought that every time it stretched the limits of believability Ben there was a plausible explanation this really is I said conveniently so there was always a reason for him to get out of it. always plausible 
Uh, I really thought this reminded me of, of some early Pollock, and I felt like I was watching sort of three days of the Condor here, one of my all-time favorites. I, I really enjoyed this movie. I don't know if it holds up to some of those all-time classics. I unfortunately was really disappointed by it, and I'm going to have to say skip it. Yeah, all right. Well, we definitely disagree on that one. Coming up next, we'll review the remake of Friday the 13th. And later, Joaquin Phoenix and Gwyneth Paltrow are caught in a love triangle in Two Lovers. But I do know you, and I love you even more. It's been years since Jason and his iconic hockey mask first terrified moviegoers in the original Friday the 13th. And it's been six years since we last saw Mr. Voorhees in Freddy vs. Jason. And here we are with the now 12th installment of the franchise, this time from producer Michael Bay. No new title for the same old, same old. It's simply called Friday the 13th. Part reinvention, part origin story, entirely mediocre. Set in where else? The haunted woods surrounding Camp Crystal Lake. My sister, she's gone missing. She ain't missing. She's dead. What? People go missing around here. They're gone for good. Outsiders come, they don't know where to walk. They bring trouble. They just won't be left alone. And so does he. No fancy special effects or convoluted plot line explaining why Jason is still alive and still killing. Just beautiful people in the woods, drunk and naked, getting hacked to pieces. That's the movie. <laughs> the film relishes in being a series of horror movie cliches strung together. We've seen it all before. We know the killer is coming from around the corner and the hot girl hiding upstairs is going to get mutilated in a matter of moments. For various reasons, audiences simply love these types of movies and this character in particular. So don't look for this to be the last we'll see of Jason anytime soon. Hopefully though, it is for me and I will save you by telling you to skip it. Yeah, you know, uh, Ben, there are ways to do cliches and horror movies that are sort of artful where you wink at the audience. And then sometimes they're just cliches. And from start to finish, these were just cliches. How many times is Jason going to show up behind a character suddenly and then, you know, stick a sword through his head? Uh, I, that troubled me throughout. I got extremely bored as the movie went on when this became incredibly predictable without, I think, really any of the fun that these movies are supposed to deliver. I think back in the 90s, there were some fun horror movies like Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer that did that. They winked at the audience and kind of poked fun at films like this. Now we've just kind of regressed and resorted back to this where every girl gets naked and every guy gets killed and everyone's on drugs and drinking. You just want it to end as soon as possible. I think you're right in part about movies that successfully parody horror movies like Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer. But I think we learned la last year that there's still a place for a traditional horror movie told well. Splinter came out toward the end of last year. Uh, inventive, plausible, took the genre in a sort of new direction while still delivering the very basic horror elements that fans want. So the key is more movies like Splinter, fewer movies like Friday the 13th, which you should definitely skip. All right, next movie, Two Lovers, from writer-director James Gray, the man behind the yards and We Own the Night, is a film that left me unsure how I felt hours after watching. Joaquin Phoenix plays Leonard in his 30s, deeply depressed and living with his concerned parents in Brooklyn. Hoping to end his isolation, his parents set Leonard up with a family friend, Sandra, a nice Jewish girl. I saw you at your parents' store and I just... You were asking your mother to dance with you. It was very cute. Sounds like something I would do. But Leonard, finally emerging from the long, hard slog of his despair, finds himself drawn to another woman, a sexy, wild new neighbor, Michelle, played by Gwyneth Paltrow. Hi. Breath? Sorry. For what? <sighs> My father is. He's a little crazy. You okay? Yeah. However, with Gwyneth's provocative allure comes mania. And obviously, Leonard should choose Sandra, played by Vanessa Shaw. The problem with the film is that his choice is too clear and a movie you sense is supposed to be a nuanced story of depression and the complexity of our emotional choices becomes far too straightforward. 
Now Joaquin Phoenix claims that he's retiring from acting and this will be his last movie. And if that's true, I think it's a shame because he's a pretty talented actor. But you should skip Two Lovers, which is in limited release and it's also available it, on demand. It really is a shame if this is Joaquin Phoenix's last film. And not because it's a bad film. And I think he gives a great performance. He has a sort of vulnerability about him and an honesty to him in all of his work. And it shines through here. I thought his connection with Gwyneth Paltrow was genuine. It develops over time. And this is kind of uh, the unromanticized version of romance and this is how love happens in the real world sometimes it hurts sometimes it's depressing it's not all she he's just not that into you I thought it was a gritty New York story and I actually really lost myself in the characters yeah look I mean it was gritty and it's small and stripped down and I have no problem with any of that I simply didn't believe it you talk about a movie contrived to get us to an ending I felt that this was enormously contrived it's supposed to be complex and I was left wondering where's the complexity it was all too simple and you talk about a movie designed to give you sort of an, an ending that sort of ties the pieces together this movie left me sort of groaning at the end Oh, I thought this was a far more honest depiction of what love is than any of these other romantic comedies we reviewed on the show this week and I'm gonna have to say see it I really enjoyed two lovers Coming up next, Angelina Jolie and her latest Oscar-nominated performance. That's on our DVD out now list. And now you have the chance to tell us what you think about all things Oscar when we take part in our first web chat this Monday. Just go to atthemoviestv.com now and register and submit a question ahead of time or just log in February 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern. I know my son is out there. I can still feel him. Time to take a look at DVDs out now. My pick this week is Changeling. It was recently nominated for three Academy Awards, including one for Angelina Jolie as Best Actress. Based on a true story, this is the methodical, disturbing thriller set in the late 1920s and early 1930s Los Angeles. It also stars John Malkovich and Jeffrey Donovan. A tough movie to endure due to its heartbreaking subject matter. Director Clint Eastwood once again brings out the best in his cast, both the major stars and the unknowns, and he fearlessly takes on the rawest of human emotions. Some powerful stuff. My DVD pick, Ben, is the Bill Maher documentary, Religious, a fairly even-handed skewering of dogmatic religious faith. The movie takes Maher around the world to talk to the devoted, those who claim to believe their particular religious text is the literal word of God. It's a provocative film, though more than anything else, it's funny. Mar is tough on Catholics, but then again, he also hammers evangelical Christians, Jews, Mormons, and Muslims. See it with a loved one, and then afterwards, you can have a really uncomfortable argument. So both Changeling and Religious will be in stores on Tuesday. Also out now on DVD, we both think you should see Spike Lee's Miracle at St. Anna. It was on my top ten list from last year. I said you could rent Knights in Rodanthe with Diane Lane and Richard Gere. Meng said you should skip it. And we both say you should see Josh Brolin in W. Want to know what you can't miss this weekend? Stay tuned for my three to see. Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. Okay, a lot of movies to recap on this week's show. We That's both say you can skip story. Confessions of a Shopaholic. I say to skip, he's just not that into you, and Ben says you should see it. I also say to skip The International, which Ben also says to see. We agree that you can skip Friday the 13th, and I say see two lovers, while Ben says to skip it. Now it's time for my three to see, the three movies you should check out this weekend. I'll start with a film we reviewed on today's show, The International, with Clive Owen and Naomi Watts. I think this is a tight, old-fashioned 70s thriller. Credit director Tom Tickfer for making international banking riveting. At number two, and I can't quite believe I'm recommending this, he's just not that into you. Few trailers have made me less excited to see a movie, but this ended up being a smart, dare I say, insightful romantic comedy with nice performances from an A-list cast. And at number one, I'm running out of chances to recommend this movie before the Oscars. Go see Darren Aronofsky's The Wrestler, the raw and touching Mickey Rourke, Marissa Tomei drama, expanded into more theaters throughout January. It's the best movie of 2008, and if you've already seen it, well, then go see it again. I agree. One of the best films of the year, and I think should have gotten nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. That's it for now. Remember, we're always online on atthemoviestv.com. Next week, we'll be back with our special show where we tell you who would take home the Oscars if we pick the winners. But until then, we'll be at the movies.